Yeah, I'm Jed, and uh, as Rachel said, I was a member of the Earth Sciences DCAM team for a year and a half from 2022 to 2023. Um, the Earth Science, Science DCAM began in 2016, and it's still not finished. So this is a snapshot of quite a, a short period of time in the broader scheme of things. Uh, and what I'll be talking about today is the process of moving our collections into new stores at Kelvin Hall. And specifically because of uh, my background, I'll be talking about the geology and paleontology collections. Um, so I will give you a little bit of context uh, first. Um, a, a decant is basically a move. That's a fancy word for, for moving all our stuff from one place to another. Uh, so where were the collections beforehand? We had some of our collections, obviously, in our in our venues, uh, both on display, so the stuff that was already on the walls in the art gallery or in the museum, uh, but also some on-site storage. Uh, otherwise, we had four other stores which were spread across Glasgow, and um, collections weren't uh, evenly dispersed across those across those stores. So. By that, I mean the geology collections weren't all in one store, which would be nice and convenient and would make sense. You would find them in three different stores at Furzo Street, uh, Lone Bank and Balmore. Uh, so that's not great for the access for the staff and also not great for access for teaching purposes and research. Um, in terms of the stores themselves, we've got a photograph on this side here of the Hamilton Hill store. Um, it's serviceable. The, the collections are in decent condition there. There's not big issues with the actual uh, location itself too too much, but it's certainly not fully up to, to modern standards. And as I mentioned, the fact that we've got these different stores spread across the city uh, make it hard for both staff and, and our, our audiences to access. Um, and Hamilton Hill store there, that looks quite nice and clean and functional. Um, some stores were really just not as uh, up to scratch, not fit for purpose. So that ranges from the environmental controls not being up to modern standards for temperature and humidity to the physical state of the buildings. And here we have a photograph of um, the Balmore stores, which is the most extreme example of this. Again, in terms of the collections themselves, the building itself is secure. The environment for the objects isn't too bad, but the stores, the actual physical environment pretty dilapidated and as this picture of the entrance to Balmore shows um not a pleasant building or or, or location to be taking uh, potential uh, researchers to uh students who would want to study um and physically distant as well from from our venues from the rest of the collections so all this basically led to um, when we received HLF funding for the Kelvin Hall project uh, to invest a lot of, um, of time and money into creating stores that were fit for purpose. So one uh, store that is designed to house all the collections in one place, along with study center, lab spaces and collection specific storage. Um, so there was a little bit of a ad hoc um, mend and make do uh, situation with some of the older stores where the storage wasn't necessarily designed for museum stores. Some of them are just warehouse spaces that have been converted. This is purpose designed and with separate areas for um, specific um, needs of collections. So on, on this slide uh, on the top left, we have um, a photograph of the low humidity store. Um, so we did have low humidity stores, um, but again, they were uh, not fully up to scratch. Um, so this has much better environmental controls. We also have a photograph on the bottom left um, of the wet stores. So again, certain objects, um, wet stores, we're keeping all the stuff in jars. Um, that's mainly anatomical and zoological collections. Uh, they have specific storage demands, and we've got better storage solutions for that. And then we have a photograph here more generally of the main store uh, and the picture racks in there. Uh, so here we have a store that's been purpose-built for our needs and for our collections needs. 
and everything in one place. Uh, so that's the dream. Uh, eight years down the line, um, we still haven't got everything in there. Um, and that's because our collections are quite big. So the figure the Hunterian uses on our website and in all our press releases is over 1.5 million items. And that isn't a lie, um, but it's also not the complete truth. There's definitely over 1.5 million items. Uh, and a figure like that, although it's good for your press release and your website to give a sense of the scope of the collections, it's not massively helpful to us when we're planning to build a new store and move an entire collection into it. And the honest answer to the question of how big are our collections is that we don't really know. And that sounds quite worrying, um, but there is a, a good reason uh, uh, behind that. So I'm gonna talk a little now about hugs. Uh, HUG stands for Hunterian Unaccessioned Group. Uh, and accessioning is the process of recording your new acquisitions, so objects coming into the collection. You're giving them a number, you're recording the location or storing them, uh, entering details about the object, their condition, any specific storage requirements, uh, the details about your donor, all that sort of very important contextual information. You're recording all that and you're putting it into your database. And that's quite easy to do if you've got a, a single artwork being donated. Um, you can do that very uh, easily. You, you've got the piece, you fill out all the information. But unfortunately, it's quite rare that someone donates a single rock to our collections. More commonly, we'll get a geologist donating their entire uh, life's work. Uh, there's also been cases where we've had entire institutions, collections coming into our ownership. Uh, so in the 1980s, Dundee University's geology department closed and their collections uh, came to us. Um, and when you're faced with that scenario, you've got thousands of objects arriving at once and you don't necessarily have the time and the resources to catalogue them. As a stopgap measure, previous creators have given just a single number to the entire donation, uh, called it a Hunterian unaccessioned group to ensure there's at the very least a basic record having all the most important contextual information. And the intention is that one day down the line, uh, they would be more fully catalogued. But unfortunately, in most cases, that day never actually arrived. Um, and that makes actually estimating the size of our collections quite difficult. So on this slide, we have the catalog record for Hug Free. Uh, which is the Jan Mine collection. Um, it's quite an important collection. Um, so it says here a major geological collection. Um, and it's uh, got film negatives, photographs, lots of volcanic bombs, quite an interesting collection to geologists. Uh, so this is not a great deal of information. Um, and as far as, our, as far as our database is concerned, because this is just one record, this would be counted as one object when we're trying to make an estimate of how big our collections are. Um, the collection actually comprises 3,641 objects. And this is one hug. There are over a thousand hug groups in the Hunterian collections. Um, so they're not all as big as this, but this is why we can't really be sure exactly how many objects we have in our collections. And part of the reason why moving our collections to Kelvin Hall, and particularly uh, the geology collections, which are full of hug groups, uh, it's been quite a long process. So with that context in mind, I'll tell you a bit about the earth science decant now and the different stages of that. Uh, the real purpose of this decant can be split into two strands, the physical move, so moving collections, from inadequate off-site stores into Kelvin Hall, improving physical access to the collection, and then improving the quality of the collection documentation, uh, adding, updating, improving the information on the collections in our database, and therefore improving digital access to the collections. So I'll talk you through the stages of uh, moving stuff from old stores to new stores. First off, rationalization. So, I've talked about the Hunterian on accession groups, uh, which aren't ideal, but they are at least a record of the stuff you have. Uh, there's also a not insignificant amount of material that was just completely unaccessioned. And again, this is something that's quite specific, a problem maybe to 
to geology and paleontology collections where you have curators who are out in the field, they're going to digs, they're coming back with all this stuff, maybe thinking, I'll work out later which of this stuff to keep and which not. And then you get however many years or decades down the line and you still have all this stuff that's never actually been recorded in any way. Uh, so the first step is really to assess what we actually have. And this is a stage that's carried out by the curators themselves. So Erica was our geology curator at the time and, and Neil, our curator of paleontology. They're the ones with the knowledge to identify what can and should be disposed of, what we don't need. They're also looking out for hazards as well. Um, so in geology collections, that can include asbestos in lots of things. Asbestos is a mineral. There's also uh, issues such as radioactive substances, uh, arsenic, poisonous substances. Um, so the images here show uh, a few different things. We've got these wrapped up trays in polythene. So we found some insect pests in some trays and we don't want to be carting lots of insect pests into our new stores. So as a precaution, anything that has a uh, potential um, to contain pests has to be wrapped and quarantined for a year. So all those trays are quarantined. We also have here an example of um, some rationalization in action. So we have these big bags of sand um, and our ge geology crater looks at that and said, we don't need this much. Um, we don't need sacks of these samples. So you can see the picture next to it shows much smaller bags. We chucked away around 90% of that material and just kept as much we actually needed to study. Um, repacking the objects. So a lot of the um, packing techniques of the past were odd to say the least. Lots of stuff wrapped in newspaper for some reason. Um, can't see through newspaper, so you'd have to unwrap every single object to actually see what it is. Uh, it's not really an approved museum packing material. Uh, and here we have these wooden trays and you can see rocks are just piled up, stacked quite haphazardly. So it's it's not really very good um, care of the collections in, in action here. Here we have some stuff that's been repacked. Um, so we've got some bitumen samples in glass bottles. And in this case, they've had custom mounts made for them out of uh, plaster zotes, which is a material um, sort of used by museums in packing. And we also have some gemstones uh, packed in cardboard trays with the label information at the bottom of the trays. Um, all of our objects were previously packed in various types of containers for lots of random cupboards, different size wooden trays. Now we packed into standardized plastic trays of two different sizes. I've got some fossils repacked here. So again, we've got some packing that wasn't ideal here. Uh, fossils that have been just sort of shoved loose in these plan chests and were rattling about in the tray as you opened and closed doors. Um, they're kept in the chest, but we've used, um, again, plaster so this padding material to separate out the fossils. And also we've used them to create these bands on the right hand side there um, to hold the, the fossils in place. Moving on to the step of improving the documentation. So we're not just taking stuff that's poorly documented, repacking it and moving on to our lives. We're trying to improve documentation as we go. We've got a another uh, example of a hug group here. Um, so this is Hug 93, which is uh, a large collection of 1,217 specimens. Uh, when we packed, it spans 31 trays. Um, so the amount of information we did have on this entire collection, very limited. I think there's maybe three sentences there. It tells you vaguely where it's from, um, although it says East Africa, which at the time the colony was British East Africa, which is now uh, what we know is Kenya. Um, and it's, it's really not telling you much in terms of detail of what's in the collection, where it's from. So just one of the 31 trays from that collection now has this level of information. It tells you exactly what each specimen is, um, the accurate numbers of specimens, and it's recording more precise locations like Port Wrights, Marikani, Kenzie. Um, we're not just transcribing the labels, but we're correcting them where possible. So a lot of these had anglicized place names, incorrectly spelt place names. Those have been corrected. We've also, as I say, this is 
labeled as the British East Africa uh, collection. So we've kept that information. That's the context in which this was collected of, of colonialism. Um, but we've updated it to say that they're uh, specimens from Kenya and we've got more detailed place names. So it's more useful to a modern day researcher. So that's just one of the 31 trays in that hug group. This is the level of information um, that we now have for that entire collection. I'm not expecting you to be able to read this. It's all uh, tiny fine print. It's just there to show the amount of extra information we're adding to this, improving the, the searchability and, and the usefulness of these uh, records for researchers. So then we get to actually moving stuff into Kelvin Hall. Uh, after specimens are packed and palleted up, they're moved by uh, Constantine, a uh, move company we, we use. Um, and we're moving stuff based on curator's recommendations of which material will be most useful in upcoming teaching, uh, research pro projects, exhibitions, and which material is the highest quality. So there's um, kind of a, a, a reason behind the stuff we're moving. We're tr trying to move the stuff first and foremost, which is going to be most useful. Um, so here we have pallets ready to load and trays of trolleys ready to be shelved. And here we see um, one of my decamp colleagues, cats in a nearly empty row, um, uh, loading up trays. We also have some specimens that we moved into the low humidity store. And this is that same row that's now full of trays. Um, so filled with newly moved geology and paleontology collections. Um, and there's a postcard there from the Hug Free um, collection, which I mentioned earlier, uh, of the Anmine collection. So that's just a small selection of those 3,641 rocks after they've been packed and moved to Kelvin Hall. So where that's left us is that the majority of our Earth Sciences collections have now been packed and documented, and those that haven't moved are ready to move. Uh, a significant amount of the collections have been moved um, out of Lone Bank and First Street and into our new stores at Kelvin Hall. And documentation has been greatly improved as well. And we're already seeing this, um, this decamp work pay dividends in terms of our research and teaching activity. So here you can see um, there's obviously a dip for COVID, but research and teaching activities have increased greatly since we moved to Kelvin Hall in 2016. Uh, so the number of separate research events and teaching events um, we had in 2023, over, over 100 research events um, uh, and over 70 teaching events. So that's each individual time that we are making use of our collections. Um, and in terms of actual object and specimen use, um, so there's a big spike in 2017 for research. I think as one researcher who's looking at lots of stuff. Again, we got the dip of COVID here, but you can see the number of objects uh, that are being used for research. Last year was over 3,000, uh, over 1,000 being used in teaching. Um, just to give you one example, uh, here we have um, Matt McCown of Stony Brook University in New York. Um, he's was over taking photos of uh, Metro Ranchus specimens, uh, and that's to produce 3D images that we'll be able to use to differentiate species using morphometrics. And it's gonna compare the data he's obtained in the Ontarian with data of a crocodile of similar age he's working on from the USA. And he's been looking at about 40 or 50 specimens, taking multiple images for a photogrammetric study of each skull, so we can try and render 3D digital models. Uh, and this is material that he's been able to work on that's been moved into our low humidity stores in Kelvin Hall uh, from our own stores. And he'll be returning to the Hunterian later on in his, his uh, research to look more closely at more material. And we're also starting to see discoveries or, or rediscoveries from our decamp work filtering into our exhibition program. So again, going back to this uh, Jan Mayan collection, the Hug Free collection, a uh, very important collection of uh, mainly uh, lava bonds, basaltic bonds, um, and some of those, some of these jam mine collections are now on display in the Trembling Museum exhibition. So we have some photographs here where you see those specimens on display. Just to finish up with a uh, look at 
uh, how far we've got in terms of numbers. We've got a large amount of our collections now in Kelvin Hall, uh, over three quarters of our collections are in Kelvin Hall. And the benefits of that improved access are starting to show in our teaching and research programs, also starting to build into our exhibition programs. Uh, and the majority of the earth sciences collections in particular are now in Kelvin Hall, uh, but there is still work to be done. Um, as I say, there's uh, been some uh, issues in terms of we've got, changed curators a couple of times. We're waiting still for a new geology curator to be appointed. Um, but definitely in terms of progress we made, although it has been eight years and it's been a lot of work, uh, we made a lot of progress with moving our stuff uh, into Kelvin Hall collections.